Matt Kane, Public Programs Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. And thank you all so much for joining us for a special program titled From Pleistocene to Present, a brief history of Mayberry Gellin Botanical Gardens, Buffalo Trace Prairie, and the surrounding area. I also want to especially thank tonight's presenter, our very own Marina Montez Ellis, uh, for presenting tonight's program. Uh, before we get to Marina um, in her presentation, uh, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items uh, and let you know what's coming up at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Uh, first, let us know where you're watching from by uh, down in the comments section below, um, uh, writing your location, um, if you're okay with that. I always love to see where folks are tuning in from uh, tonight. Um, so let us know where you're watching from by jotting that down in the comments section below. Also, if you have any questions during tonight's presentation, write those questions into the comments section as well. Um, a little bit about the Museum of the Grand Prairie. Um, if you don't know much about us, uh, we originally opened in 1968 as the Early American Museum, and our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County in East Central Illinois. Um, we're part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. We're located at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve here in Muhammad, Illinois. Um, Champaign County Forest Preserve District consists of seven beautiful forest preserves throughout Champaign County, two educational facilities, including our museum, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center and Homer Lake Forest Preserve, uh, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, and so much more. So check out the museum or the Champaign County Forest Preserve District if you're local, or visit us online at our websites at museumthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org or on our social media pages to learn more. Um, also, we would love to hear from you um, after tonight's program. Let us know what you thought. Uh, we have a short program survey that I'm dropping into the comment section right now. Um, let us know what you thought of tonight's program, and then also uh, give us your thoughts on what types of programs you would like for us to offer in the future, what topics you want us to discuss, what types of programs you would love to see us host in person or virtually um, at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District. A few programs coming up in the near future. Um, uh, Night Lights in the Garden. Uh, this is the first time uh, we've done this at Champaign County Forest Preserve District and Mayberry Gellin Botanical Garden, but beginning last weekend um, and on Fridays and Saturday nights, except for actually tomorrow night, we just got news that uh, our lights, uh, our, our holiday lights in the garden will be canceled tomorrow night due to weather. But every Friday and Saturday after that, all the way until January 8th, Mayberry Gellin Botanical Garden uh, will be lit up from 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, and then also on January 8th, that final night, um, we're hosting a closing event from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, that will feature free hot chocolate, free 3D holiday light glasses for the first 50 patrons. And you can also register in advance um, on our website to pick up a winter themed mini garden kit uh, that you can pick up on the evening of January 8th. Um, so again, check out Night Lights in the Garden every Friday and Saturday from 4 to 8 p.m until January 8th. Again, tomorrow's lights are canceled though, due to the weather. Um, this year's Garden Speaker Series, we're kicking it off on Thursday, January 20th. Uh, the theme for this year's series will deal with medicinal plants, how humans have used them throughout history, and how to start a medicinal plant garden of your very own. I uh, hope you can join us and Professor Emerita of Pathology at the Indiana University School of Medicine, Kathleen Hall, MD. She'll discuss her involvement as the head of the Indiana Medical History Museum's Medicinal Garden Project, and also tell us about how particular plants have been used for medicinal purposes throughout history and how a few of them have led to some modern medicines we still use today. Uh, one last thing to promote, uh, CCFPD, Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, will be doing another CCFPD snowflake search this winter, beginning on January 20th. Uh, we will hide over 30 creatively painted snowflakes along with fun winter themed uh, facts throughout Champaign County Forest Preserves for you, uh, your friends and family to find. Uh, the search again will take place beginning on January 20th and run all the way through the end of February. Uh, you can follow along at the hashtag CCFPD Snowflake Search as we share updates in the coming weeks and months about the 2022 CCFPD Snowflake Search. Um, for more info about all these programs and everything else happening at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and CCFPD, uh, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, or again, visit our websites at museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Again, let us know where you're watching from tonight. Have some folks letting us know in the comments where they're tuning in from. Uh, Kathleen, tuning in, 
tuning in from Canton. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for watching. Um, uh, uh, we got DNCU tuning in from Urbana. Thank you so much. Uh, June from Berwyn and Josh from Washington. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Got an excellent program for you. Um, and with that, who, who is going to present this excellent program? Um, our very own um, uh, Marina Montez Ellis. So let's bring on Marina. Marina, can you hear me? Can you see me? I can, Pat. Hi. Okay. Hey, how's it going? Good. All right. So I'm going to introduce Marina um, and then I will turn the presentation over to her. So Marina Montez Ellis is the Garden Program Specialist for the Museum of the Grand Prairie here in Muhammad, Illinois. Um, Marina encourages children to engage in nature by leading the summer garden camps and various outdoor events at the museum's Mayberry Gelman Botanical Garden and restored prairie sites. Uh, Marina received her Bachelor's of Science in Forestry from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and then served as a Peace Corps volunteer as an environmental science educator in Bolivia. So without further ado, let's give a warm virtual welcome to Marina. Thank you so much, Marina. Sure. Um, so I'll go ahead and start sharing. Okay. How is that, Pat? Can you see that? Yep, we can see it. Okay, good. Oh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight um, and uh, for my presentation from Pleistocene to Present, a brief history of the Mayberry Gelbin Botanical Gardens in Muhammad area. So the Champaign County Preserves District's mission is to bring the community closer to nature, and the Museum of the Grand Prairie's mission is to bridge the gap between our history, natural spaces, people, and culture. The CCFP uh, PD maintains several preserves, which include Lake of the Woods, Heron View, and River Bend in Muhammad, Homer Lake, Middle Fork River Forest Preserve in Penfield, Sangamon River Forest Preserve in Fisher, and the Kickapoo Rail tra Trail, which stretches from Urbana to Oakwood. I guess I have a little map here that you can see some of the um, areas. Uh, the CCFPD manages more than 3,800 acres of natural space in and forest preserves located in central Illinois. As a museum garden program specialist, I merged the garden education with the natural and cultural history of Champaign County. So I'll start the presentation with the natural history of the area. 1.6 million years ago, there was abrupt change in, in climate and ice sheets formed and spread from the North Pole. So more than 38, I'm sorry, 85% of Illinois was covered in glaciers during that time. Paleo-Americans were able to cross these ice sheets. They crossed the Bering Strait about 12,000 years ago at the end of the Pleistocene at a time when mastodons and mammoths roamed the area. In Southern Illinois, researchers unearthed evidence that Paleo-Americans hunted mammoths. These nomadic tribes followed the animal's migration patterns. They also hunted an early form of bison. 11,000 years ago, uh, there was a mass extinction of this, these large animals these mammals like mammoth and mastodons and Paleo-Americans began to hunt smaller mammals for survival. Most of their tools and weapons were portable and transported to temporary camps in this pre-agricultural ice age. The atlatl was one of these weapons. The technology at the time was developed about 10,000 years ago. The atlatl first appeared in Illinois around 8,000 BCE. This weapon te technology allowed the hunters to throw a spear with greater force at a greater distance and with more accuracy. Prairies were formed after the Pleistocene glaciation after a series of different ecosystems from tundra to hardwood forest. The prairies developed after the climate became substantially warmer and drier. Prairies are actually a recently developed ecosystem having been formed about 8,000 years ago. From about 10,000 years ago, until about 3,000 years ago, uh, lived Native Americans called archaic people. They hunted white-tailed deer, elk, and rabbit. They also supplemented their diet with roots, berries, and nuts. The archaic people learned to plant crops and so were able to stay in one place, usually along a river uh, for a longer period of time. Bone studies uncovered that archaic people lived to be about 25 to 30 years old and evidence of arthritis in the bones, possibly from a, a pretty difficult life. 
they had few cavities and uh, that led researchers to believe that their foods were very, uh, had very low sugar. The woodland people lived in Illinois from 1000 BCE to 1000 CE. They made pottery and built homes from plant material, lived in community, communities that hunted, gathered plants and grew crops. Pottery was made by the archaic people, but the woodland people, um, their pottery was more advanced with more creative and artistic design. The first evidence of the bow and arrow is also discovered during this time. From 1000 to 1300 CE, the Mississippian people lived in, a lar in large towns that had wall defenses, earthen mounds as homes and temples and houses built to last multiple years. They could plant large fields of corn, beans, and squash and made stone tools for far farming, hunting, and trading with other groups. Um, if you're familiar with the Cahokia people near uh, settlements near St. Louis, they lived in the woodland area and flourished during the Mississippian time around 1100 to 1200 CE. In the late prehistoric time, people lived in smaller communities. The large scale communities like Cahokia have long been abandoned. Evidence shows many conflicts between different groups at this time. In the 1600s, after the arrival of Columbus, French explorers reached Illinois. The arrival of European immigrants brought more trade, but also disease and severe changes to the Native American way of life. In the 17th century, French explorers referred to this group of tribes in, in this area as the Confederation of Illinois or the Illiniwick. This group included the Peoria, Cahokia, Kaskaskia, and Michigami, among others. In 1763, after the French and Indian War concluded, the British took control of Canada in the Mississippi Valley, a precursor to the Revolutionary War, leading to a new United States uh, and a uh, government and westward expansion. By, nine, by 1765, the Illiniwick were being forced out by warring tribes. The Sauk, Fox, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi, who lived mainly in Northern Illinois, became the dominant tribe in Central Illinois until the early 19th century. Uh, with a territory for the Illiniwick, with a territory that included Illinois, uh, Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri, it was now reduced to a few miles in Illinois, as you can see from this map, uh, those two uh, circles are their territory by uh, 1832. The Potawatomi tried to stay neutral during, oops, let me go back to that. The Potawatomi tried to stay neutral uh, for the Revolutionary War, but uh, they ended up siding with the English. They referred to the colonies as the 13 fires. That same year, of uh, the Treaty of Paris extends the United States boundary to include Illinois. The Kickapoo are an offshoot of the Shawnee. Kickapoo may, may mean wanderer in a corrupted Shawnee word for wanderer. Kiwaka Pawa. The Kickapoo had two groups, the Prairie Band and the Vermilion Band. The Vermilion Band had settlements at the confluence of the Middle Fork and Salt Fork Rivers in part of present day Kickapoo State Park. The Sagamon River Valley was, all, was used as summer hunting grounds with plentiful gain and abundant forests for nuts and fruits along the river. In 1818, after Illinois becomes the 21st state with a population of about 35,000, the Kickapoo are forced further west of the Mississippi, uh, relinquishing claim of much of their lands in central Illinois. Some Native American groups tried to adapt to the new ways, while others fought aggressively against it. The Kickapoo chose to retreat further south from the European settlements. In 1822, Champaign County sees its first white settlers. The remaining Kickapoo and other tribes are forced out of the state by the Indian Removal Act of 1830. The Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, and Potawatomi are among the tribes in other states that are forced to move south. The Cherokee Trail of Tears and the Potawatomi Trail of Death are documented mass removals by militia escorts. 859 Potawatomi were forcibly removed from Indiana to Kansas. Their journey led through Illinois, making stops at Danville, Decatur, and Monticello. According to the Kansas Historical Society, a witness account reads, the white men were gathering thick around them, which was necessary for the departure, but they still clung to their homes. The flames of the torch were applied, their villages and wigwams annihilated. 
Native American tribes were forced to abandon their past ways and adapt to the changing systems. These atrocities paved the way for the incoming European immigrants. In 1832, Isaac Busey of Busey Bank in Busey Woods in Urbana makes the first recorded land purchase of 120 acres. The transfor transformation of land was swift and unrelenting. Uh, so I'll go into some of the prairies around here. The, the prairie ecosystems are characterized by um, as drought tolerant with extreme high and low temperatures and rich soils, as we all know. Tall grass prairies in Illinois have extensive root systems that can grow twice as long as the above ground stems. Plowing the prairie soil was a labor intensive and difficult job, needing up to seven teams of oxen to pull the plow through the sod. Farmers would have to stop frequently and scrape the soil that stuck to the plow blades. In 1837, John Deere introduces the self-scouring, self-bladed, I'm sorry, steel-bladed plow, and with a period of about 50 years, the majority of prairies are converted to farmland. Swampy prairies are drained and plowed. By 1849, John Deere was selling 2,000 plows per year. The European settlers initially believed that the prairies were vast wastelands. The lack of trees that they were used to in their homelands led them to believe the soil was infertile. Ecologists today have found that prairies hold similar plant and animal diversity as tropical rainforest ecosystems, and that wetlands in the Midwest are on par with the richness of the Everglades. The Federal Swamp Land Act of 1848 allowed for the land to be sold cheaply and drainage tiles to be installed. The increase of croplands and human population affected the rich flora and fauna, the marshes, fens, and prairies of Illinois. Prior to this agricultural boom, there were 22 million acres of prairie grasslands and wildflowers that blanketed Illinois, more than 60% of the state. And you can see in this map, the yellow um, is, is where the tall grass prairie stretched. Illinois is dominated by tall grass prairie, but also has dry gravel, black soil, shrub, sand, hill, and dolomite prairies. Today, less than 2,300 acres of the original habitat remains, about one one hundredth of a percent. There are original prairie remnants in Illinois today, surviving due to the rocky terrain, which makes for difficult crop production. Right now, there is a movement to save the Belbo Prairie in Rockford, Illinois, due to the expansion plans of the Chicago Rockford International Airport. Belbo Prairie is a dry gravel prairie that has been relatively undisturbed for 8,000 years and a rare patch of original remaining prairie in Illinois. So here I have a picture. It's actually of a Nebraska a family migrating to Nebraska, but it is uh, relevant to um, all you know, European uh, immigrants that uh, migrated to the area or to the West. So in Isabel Purnell's book, The History of Muhammad Schools, she includes a brief history of the Fisher family who migrated to Muhammad area in 1840s. As she puts it, as we read this early history, we can visualize some of their difficulties and hardships, their struggle for mastery of the wilderness and their encounters with the Indians. The encounters between Native Americans and European settlers were well document, documented by the colonists, but unfortunately not many by the first people of the continent and how the changing world severely affected their way of life. Although the Fishers were still in Ohio, there certainly would have been similar encounters in Illinois. In 1836, Fishers built a small home in Williams County, Ohio, living near a neighboring band of Potawatomi for three and a half years. And uh, Purnell writes, the Indians who were Potawatomi, San Luis, and Sanduskis were happy, sociable, and honest with all their dealings, and the fishers traded with the Indians, vegetables, buckskins, venison, baskets, old silver, etc. The Sanduskis were civilized, so the chief's wife and daughters, having become acquainted with the Methodist faith under Finley's preaching as a missionary among their tribe, belonged to the Methodist church. John and Robert, James Fisher's sons, both enjoyed telling of the fun they had as children, watching the women cut down trees, which were some three feet in diameter to get an old raccoon or porcupine. Then they tied the legs of the animal together and hung it across the pole and carried the animals back to camp for a feast. These women trudged through snow, 10 to 18 inches in depth for, di for distances of three to four miles in order to attend the church services. 
The fishers would invite them for dinner, for, which would consist of cornbread, potatoes, spice brush tea, parched corn, coffee, and with luck, they might have wild turkey, squirrel, or pheasant, or at least something extra for Sunday dinner. James Fisher's family arrived on July 10th, 1848 at Goose Creek in Piatt County uh, at the home of his brother, Abraham. He later moved his family to Muhammad. In 1853, the Rayburns, their 10 children, and other families, along with seven covered wagons, traveled from Ohio to the Muhammad Township. According to the News Gazette article in 1911, the trip from Ohio was made in 10 days, the party arriving here on October 15th, and en route only 60 cents of bread was purchased, as the women made pancakes and biscuits. That same year, John Rayburn purchases 650 acres of land from Bloomington Road to north of the Museum of Grand Prairie for $10.73 an acre. In 1871, Middletown changes its name to Muhammad. It is named after an East Coast Mohegan chief, Muhammad Wayoman, who was admired by the first postmaster of Middletown Township, whose family uh, migrated from Connecticut. There was already a village in Illinois by the name of Middletown, and the railroad policy uh, did not allow for duplicate town names in the same state, so it, uh, Middletown had to change to Muhammad. In 1963, land east of Route 47 is purchased, the site of the Museum of the Grand Prairie, and then in 1969, CCFPD purchases land from the Rayburn Purnell family for Lake of the Woods. Now, this is an aerial shot. It's the same shot. It's just two different perspectives, and that large patch of um, trees is the Rayburn Purnell uh, lot, and then you see the uh, north on, on the colored picture the Museum of the Grand Prairie, along with the, the beginning of the Botanical Gardens. And here is a 1940 aerial view of the same, uh, the same spot, the Rayburn Purnell Woods, and a former ho homestead is in the place of the Botanical Gardens. So this is a 1940s aerial view of Lake of the Woods area, um, the golf course. And so you can see it was just agriculture before uh, that time. And uh, in 1951, the golf course was constructed. So here's an old photo uh, in 1951 of H.I. Galvin, the, uh, the first director of the CCFPD and friends after a day of golf at the pro shop. And the pro shop looks very different today than it did then. Here is a 1971 picture postcard of the Lake of the Woods golf course. Uh, there, we have a series of postcards um, from 1971, and um, I'll, sh be sh I'll show you more of these postcards. Uh, they must have been sold either at the, the golf course or at the museum. And here is a shot of the golf course today. So then in 1965, the covered bridge at Lake of the Woods is constructed. It is the exact replica of the Pepperell Bridge near Boston and was designed by German Gerfinkel, who was a civil engineering instructor at the University of Illinois. The bridge connects the two sides of the Sangamon after an 80 acre tract of land was purchased in 1960. In 19 96, the bridge was expanded to include a bike and pedestrian path. And here you can see a dedication ceremony which, with H.I. Galvin speaking and a pretty old shot of um, Lake of the Woods. Additionally, there is a colony of brown bats that reside at the bridge. A popular program called Bats at the Bridge helps to educate the community on why bats are good for the ecosystem. A new roof is now needed for the bridge and a campaign for donations is underway. So in the 1960s, recreational activity was a focal point for the preserves district. And so according to this January 1975 map, map booklet, Lake of the Woods also had a softball field not far from the covered bridge, which is no longer there. They offered boat tours and golf cart 
golf cart tour. Here's another picture postcard from 1971. From the 1960s to 1970s, Lake of the Woods also had a beach. In its day, this is a great place to hang out with friends and family. Here you can see the, um, some rules at the beach and um, there's quite a few people there. Um, here you can actually see the beach slide in the background. So here is the top of the beach slide. Um, people would climb to the top with a wood toboggan, slide down and drag the heavy wood sled back to the beach. Here is the original wooden sled for the beach slide. It measures about four by two. And uh, it is, it has four metal wheels that slid on a track on the slide, much like a roller coaster. Here's a couple more photos. Um, I mean, it looks awfully fun, but probably a bit dangerous. The slide was discontinued because of increasing insurance liabilities and safety issues. And here's some more. And these black and white photos are from the News Gazette archives in 1971. And here are some more of um, aerial shots. And you can see the parking, there's just a ton of cars. And this road um, on, the, on the bottom of the black and white photo um, is uh, Lake of the Woods Road. Now we move on to our museum, the Museum of the Grand Prairie. At, in 1968, it opened as the Early American Museum. In 2011, the Early American Museum was renamed the Museum of the Grand Prairie. Champaign County is completely situated in what the French termed the Grand Prairie. What they saw was a sea of grasses, a treeless prairie with vegetation so tall that they could barely see over it on horseback. The museum specializes in the local history of Champaign County. In 2019, the new Freedom Mums Discovering Home opens. This room was a partial renovation of the original Discovery Room that opened in 2000. The wigwam was updated and refreshed as part of the renovation. Freedom Mom was a volunteer at the Museum of the Grand Prairie for 10 years and was the founder of the Harvesters, which ran the education programs here. Frida passed in 2014, leaving a generous donation with, which helped fund this exhibit. Freedom Mom is an example of how we rely on the efforts of, of our volunteers. Our programs and events would not be possible if not for all the volunteers in our community. The Discovery Garden, which is behind the museum, was added. Uh, this, it's, it's there to enhance our summer garden camps. Kids are encouraged to plan, plant, and pick the bounty from the Discovery Garden. All community members are encouraged uh, to pick produce also and welcome to do that. What grows there varies from year to year. We, try to, we usually have strawberries uh, and tomatoes. And uh, we also have a plot of aromatic herbs. In 1974, major renovations of the garden was funded by H.I. Gelvin, the founder of CCFPD, and dedicated to his wife, Mayberry Gelvin. The renovations were designed as Swiss gardens. Tulips and roses were used in many of the beds. Here's the flagpole that sits in the garden. Um, in 1974, it was surrounded by roses after the renovation. And the flagpole today is surrounded by vertigo grass, daylilies, and annuals. Here is another shot, another perspective of the gardens from the pond. Um, you can see in 1974, the original pond and the original bridge in today's garden. In 2019, the pond underwent renovations. A new liner and pump was installed. The waterfall was redesigned. The, co the koi in the pond can overwinter because of the renovations now. Uh, so when the temperature is less than 50 degrees, the koi's metabolism slows and they don't need as much food. So uh, make sure to keep your Cheerios at home until spring when it's okay to feed them again. 
they are given special food by the staff during the winter time. So we'll go over uh, some of the landscapes at the garden. Um, the garden flowers in the summer are a mix of showy landscape, non-natives and prairie native plants. Coordination between the education department and the garden staff means beautiful and educational displays for all the visitors in the garden. The garden staff makes it all work with tropicals, native prairie plants, spring perennials and summer annuals. Plants that Native American and early settler used uh, to sustain life during the pre-colonial and colonial times are important part of the educational programs at the museum. So here I, uh, we have peonies, uh, which are just nice, bright and showy. And then we have milkweed, which is a native prairie plant that's important to the prairies. So here we have the gazebo. The gazebo actually sits pretty central in our gardens. Uh, and as you can see, it's, um, it's a focal po point of the garden because visitors are naturally drawn to shelter. Uh, lots of annuals and elephant ears, as well as ferns and hanging pots. So here's the bridge today on the, over the waterfall, the red bridge and waterfall has been a backdrop for graduation and wedding photos, as well as homecoming or prom pictures for all forms of social media. Putting effort into keeping these areas updated, updated is a must. Seasonal displays are popular. The wagon gets a wardrobe change from summer annuals to fall harvest and then a winter holiday look. So you can also see this wagon uh, if you come to see our night lights display in the garden. The garden has a range of influences from Asian inspired Zen gardens situated near the schoolhouse uh, to stumpery dis displays. This display is in the southeast corner of the gardens. It's hidden behind the waterfall. It's a pretty spectacular display of red, a mix of red cedar, hedge apple, root wads, and live oak stumps, ferns, hosta, and New Guinea impatiens. Also near the waterfall, we have an enabling garden. The en en enabling garden is paved spacious area with pots at varying levels that provides accessibility, and encourages gardeners of any age or ability. So situated in our gardens is also our schoolhouse. Um, this is actually, this is the Hensley, the former Hensley Town Hall, which was moved to the Botanic Gardens in 1982. Hensley Town Hall was built in 1895. Today, it serves as a one-room schoolhouse for our museum, where the community can experience what education was like in the early European immigrant communities. Depending on the source, the first school in the Muhammad area was established in 1835, with Mr. Cooper being the first school teacher with a salary ranging from $15 to $20 a month. According to the history of Champaign County, the first school on the Sangamon was a log cabin, 16 by 18 feet, located a half mile south of Muhammad, of course, then Middletown, in 1835. The teacher being Charles Cooper and the children being J.R. Robinson, Maxwell, Scotts, Osborne, and Lindsay's, and that the windows were of greased paper. Frank Rayburn noted that the old egg-shaped stove of along about noon would have taken the chill off. The ink bottles froze solid every night. My job was to gather them up and place them under the stove to thaw them out. Another student, Edith Shively Wege, stated, your face scorched and your feet froze about the old stove used in the wintertime. Um, this is a picture from Isabel Purnell's book, uh, A History of Muhammad Schools. Uh, and in there, she actually has uh, an account. She describes an evening during the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic. Miss Marie Lindsay was my teacher in the second grade. She roomed at our house. This was the year of the horrible flu epidemic. There were so many deaths that my mother and father sang for eight funerals in 10 days. Shall I ever forget when both Marie and my father were so ill with the flu that my mother did the farm chores and managed the household? Nothing tasted good to patients. Mother whipped cream and froze it outside in a snowdrift. 
That evening, we were all looking forward to the delicacy of the whipped cream for the evening meal, but that seemed to be the only thing the two patients too wanted, and it tasted so good that they could eat more and more, so we did not get any. Of course, this seems pretty relevant to today. Here's a, an aerial view of um, the summer of 2020, the, the gardens. The Mayberry Botanical Gardens has trees that serve to educate and enthrall visitors. Throughout the garden, there are brief descriptions of many plants and trees. The Botanical Garden has many varieties of oaks, including pin, red, and white oak. We also have fruit and nut trees like persimmon, black walnut, and shagbark hickory. So this is a common persimmon tree that's in our garden. Um, this is, was an important fruit bearing tree for Native Americans and early European settlers. Uh, the persimmon is a dioecious species, which means it, need, which means it needs two, uh, it has two genders, a male and female species. And you need two of um, the, the genders in order to produce fruit. So here is an aerial view of the Rayburn Purnell Woods in Woodlot in 1988. The museum um, and is at the north end again, and then the pond is visible. So what I'm showing here is that this overlapping of the two, um, the blue outline and the yellow, that overlapping space is where our nature trail resides. So this is um, an old um, woodlot that the Rayburn Purnell family used, um, and some of the trees there are over 175 years old. So along the west side of the garden is our nature trail. It's a short trail in the understory of a variety of trees. Maintaining this trail means keeping poison oak in check. The shady area is a great habitat for this plant. So if you do take a walk in that um, path, stay on the path. Uh, especially during the summer. In this trail, we also have uh, the Vanishing Axe exhibit. It was created by the Morton Arboreta and highlights specific trees around the world that are threatened and endangered. So in early spring, you can, you can find lots of our spring ephemerals. Um, and this happens, these, these plants come out while it's still cold and before the trees start to leaf out. Here we have bloodroot. It's a beautiful bloom. We also have bluebells, which everybody always gets excited about um, in early spring, where they can they start. It starts to get a little bit warm. You can start uh, walking on the trails again, and um, you can see this blanket of bluebells. And every once in a while, you can see a pink one. So here, now we're going to move over to the west side of 47. Uh, and this is an aerial view in 1973 showing farmland once again. And um, in 1976, the farmland was purchased for Buffalo Trace Prairie. Here's another. This is an, a current, a 2020 view of uh, the museum and garden in Buffalo Trace. And so the Buffalo Trace Prairie is named for the millions of buffaloes that roam the area and form traces during early migration. The Native Americans and European settlers use these traces to hunt buffalo. Prairies tolerate natural disturbances like buffalo migration and grazing. So this bison skull was found by a hiker in 2018. It was found at Middle Fork River Preserve. According to radiocarbon dating, it's about 380 years old. We had um, a bit of a dedication ceremony for this one, for this uh, bison and the information that was given by um, the researchers uh, at Middle Fork. And you can see his name is Lenny, which is short for Lenaswa, which is an Illinois Miami word for bison. Here's a picture of a deer trace. So we still have um, white-tailed deer that live in the area no buffalo. And here is a great 
great picture that was taken by staff at the preserves, a photo reminder to keep pets leashed for the safety of all animals, wild and domestic. There also have been coyote sightings and there are signs up at the, at, at the trails uh, to warn visitors to keep their pets close and to not feed the coyotes. So at sunrise or sunset, winter or spring, Buffalo Trace Prairie has magnificent views. The area was a mix of savanna, forest, and prairie ecosystems. European settlers converted the area to pasture or row crops, to, so native seed from the original prairie is long gone. In 2000, ecological res restoration was needed to combat invasive shrub and tree species that overtook the space. Today, maintenance includes seed collection and dispersal, removing non-natives, in prescribed burns and mowing. Um, and there are about seven miles of paved and natural paths at Buffalo Trace. And I've highlighted a few of the species. Here is Rattlesnake Master. Um, this was named uh, because it thought that they thought an early European immigrants thought that it was an antidote for snake bites, which it is not. Uh, we have cut plant. And this is named because of the, the way the leaves are, it can hold water. We have some prairie dock. Now prairie dock and cup plant, and then the next one, compass plant, they're all in the same family and these have very rough textured leaves. We also have big blue stem, which is the Illinois state grass. And you can see that uh, it has, it makes the seed head separates into three parts. And so it has a nickname turkey foot. We also have wild bergamot and we have varieties of milkweed. This is swamp milkweed, but we also have um, common milkweed, which of course is important for monarchs for their life cycle. These species all are all part of the diversity within the prairie and vital to the small mammals, reptiles, and insects that make their home within this ecosystem. And here are two species that are problematic today. Uh, maintaining the prairie means weeding out non-native and invasive species. And this is the bush honeysuckle and the calorie pear. So we move on to prescribed burns, which helps us uh, to keep out invasives. So today pres prescribed or controlled burns are used by the Natural Resource Department here at CCFPD. These prescribed burns give native plants a competitive edge over non-natives, destroys invasive and invading vegetation and recycles nutrients back into the soil. It's also a way to reduce fuel buildup to prevent or minimize uncontrolled burns. Indigenous people all over the world have con used controlled burns for over 10,000 years for these same reasons. Fires are a way for prairies to preserve their native plants. The Potawatomi in Miami used, to used fire to trap and hunt bison, deer, and elk. The hunts were after the first, the first killing frost in October and November. According to French accounts, in Illinois, hunters would kill up to 120 bison in one day. Fire chiefs would organize crews and severe penalty, penalties would be imposed on those who scared off the buffalo before the hunt. Sides of meat were cut off, smoked, and returned to the villages to be divided, divided among the tribe. Several accounts of these hunts were do documented by the explorers, immigrants, and missionaries in the area. In 1674, the French explorer La Salle described a scene. To the right and left stretched the boundless prairie dotted with leafless groves and bordered by gray wintry forests, scorched by the fires, kindled in the dry grass by the Indian hunters, and strewn with carcasses of bleached skulls of innumerable buffalo. Another account in 1837 by a physician in Wisconsin, the prevailing winds were west and north of west with a dry atmosphere. The country was on fire for 40 miles around us. As the human population increased within the Midwest, these prairie fires became a nuisance to the European immigrant settlements, causing them to lose livestock, crops, and homesteads. By the time of the Civil War, this Native American practice had diminished. Laws were passed to prevent prairie burns. So now we move on to River Bend in South Muhammad. This land was acquired in 2001. River Bend is a 275 acre site with two lakes. And uh, 
Here we have a, what's called a possibility pier that allows a seated person to fish through railing slots and use tackle tables that are convenient at a convenient height. Um, a sustainability fact about River Bend is that uh, the unnecessary roads at Lake of the Woods at Lake of the Woods Preserve was taken were taken out and the material was reused to construct roads at River Bend. Altogether, 820 tons of recycled concrete and more than 400 and 4,500 tons of recycled asphalt were used for the multi-use trails and roads within River Bend. This site is situated along the Sangamon River where it used to be a sand and gravel mine. Ponds called, ponds called wetland bioswells are situated within the preserve to catch pollutants. Volunteers for the preserves and the community help maintain the rivers and trails within the area. Again, reiterating the value and need for volunteers. This Sangamon River cleanup retrieved metal, tires, and barrels within the preserve. So I'm coming to a close. Here are some of my credits. And my final slide is of the other preserves at the CCFPD. Um, so please go out and visit these wonderful outdoor spaces and see what they have to offer. Uh, our Dark Sky Park and Middle Fork is the only one in Illinois. Um, and then we also have Homer Lake and another wetland in uh, Point Pleasant uh, Middle Fork Preserve and the Kickapoo Rail Trail. So I'll um, kick it back over to Pat uh, if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. Um, that was an excellent presentation. And, you know, there's so much I didn't know. Uh, and I learned a whole bunch there uh, as well. So I, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, given that that history and uh, oh, sure. not only cultural and but but natural as well and getting us all the way up to the current times. Um, uh, if you have any questions out there, um, let us know in the comments section um, and uh, be happy to answer some here at the end. A few questions. Uh, start off, Marina. Um, mm -hmm. I had a question. You sure. you had your credits there at the end and you had your sources throughout. Is is there any particular source that you really enjoyed like studying for this presentation one you found very useful or or you know really dove well into and then also if folks out there want to learn more do you have any recommendations for you know books or websites or other resources that folks could check out oh sure you know i did find um so isabel s purnell was a resident of and she lived her whole life in muhammad and she wrote a few books. Uh, one of them was the history of Muhammad schools and um, the unofficial history of Muhammad. And I actually used the one, the school book one, um, much more. They, she had a lot of um, accounts, you know, uh, just people remembering the times, like when she wrote about the pandemic, um, about her uh, relatives that went to school. Uh, so I, I did enjoy reading um, those books. Um, as far as uh, websites, you know, around here, the Champaign County Historical Society, I believe, um, had some great information. Um, the surveys, uh, the Illinois State Geological Survey and the Illinois uh, Natural History Survey also had a lot of great information about, um, you know, the, the natural history, like the Pleistocene, the glaciation. And of course, the Natural History Survey with um, the Prairie information. So those were those are all great, great resources. Yeah. And um, another question, you know, I, I find this necessary, you know, and I know I know you do, too. But for those out there watching, why do you think why do you think it's important to, you know, study this cultural and natural history and, you know, the landscape that that we have here in central Illinois. Why do you think, why do you think that's something that's important to do? Oh, oh, sure. Um, well, you know, we're, we're coming into this age of, um, there's a lot going on right now. And, um, you know, we're thinking about climate change. We're thinking about um, this, the, our, this pandemic we're in. And um, at least um, I think there's a lot of evidence out there. And certainly it's something that I, uh, have beliefs in is that you know everything kind of comes back to the natural uh the natural environment and so if we learn about that uh, maybe we can kind of figure out some of these some of these issues that we're having today sure yeah. 
Thanks, Brina. Um, and again, if you have any questions, let us know by writing in the comment section down below. Got one question here from uh, Jessica. Not sure if there's any more uh, relation here, Marina. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's my sister. Uh, she lives okay. in Wisconsin. Hey, Jessica. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, uh, she's curious: Does the museum use trail cams for wildlife? Yeah, we do. Um, I I don't know exactly where they are, but I know if you go onto the Facebook page. Um, they've shown, I think they just recently show, showed um, one, I don't recall recall where, um, where they had some coyotes going through a trail. Um, and I think they have one at the wetland um, at Middle Fork also, because I've seen some of um, some of the migrating birds. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, the Natural Resources Department, they, they post some really cool, you know, as you mentioned, some really cool videos. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, check out that uh, 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 Forest Preserve District Facebook and YouTube page. Yeah, uh, they, 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 I know they post them on occasion when they, when they yeah. get a good um, animal, you know. I think, I think earlier in the year, there was a really nice video of a mother fox um and some young foxes too on a trail cam which was really yeah cool to see too. they're so, pretty yeah. good yeah yeah they do an excellent job of monitoring the wildlife so um uh june says thank you so much for this interesting presentation and and i sure, thank a whole you bunch june, of for too. tuning in yeah um we don't have any more questions coming in okay. but if we do uh if you do have a question uh you know this video will continue to stay on our uh, Facebook and YouTube pages. So jot those questions down below. Be happy to address those um, later. But um, thank you so much, Marina. Uh, sure. For no, yeah, I enjoyed. I enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, yeah. A lot of work went into it. It's very obvious of that, and very knowledgeable. And I've got a thing or two to learn from you. Um, so really, <laughs> really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks everybody out there for watching tonight. Uh, tune in again when we do more virtual programs or, you know, come out to the night lights in the garden, um, you know, this winter season or, you know, just come out and enjoy the, the natural world in Champaign County um, uh, uh, throughout the Forest Preserve District. So thanks again so much for tuning in. Thank you to you, Marina. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Okay. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to CUI's TV. We hope you enjoyed the show. This video can be accessed anytime on youtube.com. In the YouTube search bar, type in UPTV6 and look for their microphone logo. We hope you will join us again next week for more local, engaging content designed specifically for Champaign County older adults. Take care and stay safe.